Welcome to the Audio Digest of the American Journal of Psychiatry. This is Dr. Susan Schultz with highlights for the month of September 2008. Please note that the full text of all articles may be viewed online at ajp.psychiatryonline.org, including all author affiliations and disclosures. We'll begin with our Treatment in Psychiatry feature. This month, Katherine Phillips and colleagues focus on body dysmorphic disorder. Then we'll turn to three articles on how mood disorders or their treatment are related in parents and children. Then we'll highlight substance use disorders. Laura Jean Byrud and colleagues report on variants in nicotinic receptors and risk for nicotine dependence. And David Gilder and colleagues report on factors associated with remission from alcohol dependence in an American Indian community group. We'll also feature an editorial discussing the Gilder article by Joe Westermeyer. Our final article will be a report by Laura Almasy and colleagues on a genome screen for quantitative trait loci influencing schizophrenia and neurocognitive phenotypes. Then we'll present an editorial by Linda Brustowitz and Ann Bassett on using quantitative traits in genetic research. Let's start with the treatment in psychiatry feature, which illustrates a problem in current clinical practice. This month, Katherine Phillips and colleagues present Body Dysmorphic Disorder, Treating an Underrecognized Disorder. Patients with this condition are preoccupied with an imagined or slight defect in appearance. They feel ashamed of their perceived ugliness and feel anxious around other people. Nearly all patients have impaired social functioning. Most of them also have impaired academic or occupational functioning. Approximately 80% report a history of suicidal ideation, and about one-fourth have attempted suicide. In community samples, point prevalence rates as high as 2.4% have been reported. However, the disorder often goes undiagnosed. Many patients are ashamed of their symptoms and are reluctant to reveal them to others. Thus, clinicians need to be alert to clues that the condition is present. Nearly all individuals perform time-consuming repetitive behaviors to check, hide, or improve their perceived appearance flaws. Common behaviors are mirror checking, camouflaging the perceived defect, comparing oneself to others, grooming excessively, seeking reassurance, touching the so-called defect to check it, dieting, and skin picking. Avoidance behaviors are also common. Before treatment, most patients have poor insight. Up to 39% are delusional and are convinced that their view of their appearance is accurate. In addition, a majority believe that other people take special notice of them in a negative way because of how they look. Body dysmorphic disorder frequently is comorbid with major depression, substance use disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder, or social phobia. However, clinicians need to distinguish it from disorders with similar symptoms. It differs from social phobia in that the fears of negative evaluation are due to concerns about physical appearance and compulsive behaviors are prominent. Obsessions and compulsions also distinguish it from major depression. It differs from OCD, however, in the patient's focus on appearance, poor insight, and greater suicidality. It can be difficult to establish enough of an alliance that the patient is willing to try psychiatric treatment. Many patients believe that cosmetic treatment is the solution to their problems. They would rather see a surgeon, dermatologist, or dentist than a psychiatrist. It can be particularly challenging to engage delusional patients in treatment. However, even patients who think that they have an actual physical problem can agree that they're suffering and have a poor quality of life. Focusing on the goals of diminishing their distress and improving their quality of life may help engage them in treatment. Motivational interviewing strategies that are modified for body dysmorphic disorder may be helpful in assessing patients' motivation and engaging them in treatment. It's important to empathize with their suffering. It's recommended that clinicians neither dismiss concerns about appearance nor agree that there is something wrong with how patients look. 
most patients can be treated successfully. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and cognitive behavioral therapy are currently considered the first-line treatments. Higher doses of SSRIs are often needed than are typically used for major depression. In studies of SSRI monotherapy, delusional patients were as likely to improve as those with the non-delusional disorder. If one SSRI is not effective, another may be. Augmentation with other agents has not been well researched but may be useful. Clinical series and observations suggest that after SSRI monotherapy has been optimized, augmenting it for 6 to 12 weeks with buspirone, clomipramine, or an atypical antipsychotic, bupropion, or venlafaxine may be helpful. In some patients, lithium or methylphenidate is useful for augmentation. Preliminary studies of cognitive behavioral therapy for body dysmorphic disorder have had encouraging results. It has led to consistently good outcomes in studies of both group and individual treatment. For patients who are too severely ill or depressed to participate in CBT, an antidepressant may improve symptoms to the point where CBT is more feasible. For patients who are not motivated enough to do CBT, motivational interviewing techniques may be helpful. Next, we'll look at reciprocal relationships between mood disorders in parents and children. We'll begin with an analysis from the STAR-D study. Daniel Pelosky and colleagues examined children of depressed mothers one year after the initiation of maternal treatment. Findings from the STAR-D child study. Baseline and follow-up assessments were conducted for 123 depressed women and their children ages 7 to 17. In the year after treatment began, more than half of the mothers had remissions. Their depression status was tracked by using their scores on the Hamilton Depression Rating Scale. The scores decreased markedly during the first three months, moderately for another three months, and then only slightly. At the beginning of treatment, about one-third of the offspring had a current psychiatric disorder. The diagnoses were made by using the Schedule for Affective Disorders and Schizophrenia for school-aged children. The number of symptoms was also recorded, with separate counts of those reported by the mother and by the child. Global functioning was assessed with the clinician-rated Children's Global Assessment Scale. Over the one year of the mother's treatment, the number of diagnoses in the children did not change significantly. The number of child-reported symptoms decreased by 3%, and the number of mother-reported symptoms decreased by just over 1%. Scores on the global assessment scale increased moderately during the first six months, with few changes after that. The decreases in the number of child and mother-reported symptoms were significantly associated with decreases in the mother's depression score. The mother's improvement tended to precede symptom and functional improvements in the children. The decrease in children's symptoms was greatest for the children of women who had remissions during the first three months of treatment. However, improvement also occurred in the children of the women with remissions after the first three months. Significant improvement was not observed among the children of mothers whose depression did not remit. Whereas most Stardy treatments were medications, Holly Schwartz and colleagues studied brief interpersonal psychotherapy for depressed mothers whose children are receiving psychiatric treatment. The offspring were 47 children ages 6 to 18 who were receiving psychiatric treatment for internalizing or externalizing disorders. Their mothers were not seeking treatment, but were diagnosed with major depressive disorder. The mothers were randomly assigned to treatment as usual or to nine sessions of interpersonal psychotherapy. The treatment differed from standard interpersonal psychotherapy in several ways. It was designed to be brief, and it used behavioral strategies to rapidly activate depressed patients. It began with an engagement session based on motivational and ethnographic interviewing and continued to draw on these strategies as needed during treatment. Also, it used specific strategies to help mothers manage problematic interpersonal relationships with their psychiatrically ill offspring. 
The therapy sessions were offered to mothers at the same time and in the same location as their child's mental health visits. The depressed women assigned to treatment as usual were informed of their diagnoses, given psychoeducational materials, and told to seek treatment. They were given referrals to mental health clinics close to their homes and were encouraged to use these services. The mothers and children were assessed at baseline and at two follow-ups. At three months, the mothers in the psychotherapy group had significantly more improvement than those receiving usual treatment. Differences were seen in their scores on several depression, anxiety, and global measures. At nine months, they had greater improvements on the Hamilton Depression Scale, the Global Assessment Scale, and CGI Severity Scale. The two groups of children did not show any difference at three months, but the offspring of the mothers receiving psychotherapy had greater reductions at nine months on the Children's Depressive Inventory and Columbia Impairment Scale. This lag in improvement among the children suggests that it was mediated by the mother's improvement. An environmental influence on the risk for depression in adolescents was examined by Aaron Tully and colleagues. They report an adoption study of parental depression as an environmental liability for adolescent depression and childhood disruptive disorders. They compared adopted and non-adopted adolescents in the Sibling Interaction and Behavior Study, a longitudinal community-based study. More than 1,000 adolescents were included, along with over 500 mothers and 500 fathers. The rates of parental depression did not differ between the adoptive and non-adoptive parents. Major depression in either parent or in the mother was associated with a greater likelihood of most psychiatric disorders in both adopted and non-adopted adolescents. This similarity indicates a significant environmental component in the adolescent's depression. Depression in the father, however, was not a risk factor for any diagnosis except attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. The authors point out that even though the odds ratio for the effect of parental depression on psychopathology did not differ significantly between the adopted and non-adopted offspring, the effects were consistently larger in the non-adopted sample. For instance, for every child outcome where the effect of maternal depression was significant, the odds ratio was at least 32% larger in the non-adoptive families. This trend is consistent with genetic as well as environmental influences. Genetic factors are the subject of our next article. Laura Jean Byroot and colleagues examined variants in nicotinic receptors and risk for nicotine dependence. The data came from a large genetic study of alcohol dependence that allowed researchers to differentiate habitual smokers from light smokers. More than 2,000 people were genotyped for a single nucleotide polymorphism that has been associated with the transition from smoking to nicotine dependence. It results in a change in the gene for the alpha-5 subunit of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, which is located on chromosome 15. Testing was also performed on another genetic variant in a cluster of genes related to the alpha-5, alpha-3, and beta-4 receptor subunits. Habitual smoking was defined as ever smoking at least one pack of cigarettes daily for six months or more. Subjects were classified as unaffected if they had smoked at least 100 cigarettes in their lifetime or had smoked daily for a month or more but had never smoked more than 10 cigarettes a day. Those who had never smoked were categorized as having an unknown phenotype. The results of genetic testing confirmed the previous finding of a relationship between nicotine dependence and the polymorphism linked to the alpha-5 nicotinic receptor subunit. In vitro studies were performed to test whether the amino acid variant actually influences receptor function. A nicotinic agonist was applied to cells expressing the more common sequence and to cells expressing the variant sequence. The variant sequence decreased the response to the nicotinic agonist but did not affect receptor expression. 
In addition, the occurrence of this genetic variant was compared in DNA from nine geographic regions that was obtained from a large DNA bank. The frequency varied dramatically. It was 37 to 43 percent in populations of European and Middle Eastern descent, but it was uncommon or non-existent in populations of African, Asian, or Native American origin. In the cluster of genes associated with the nicotinic receptor subunits, another polymorphism was also associated with heavy smoking. It appeared to be independent of the first significant genetic variant and was related to the alpha-3 subunit. This finding also confirms previous results. Now let's turn to factors associated with remission from alcohol dependence in an American Indian community group, a study reported by David Gilder and colleagues. Also noteworthy were some of the factors that were not associated with remission. The participants were American Indians from eight contiguous reservations. Recruitment used a combination of methods, one based on venue for sampling hard-to-reach populations and a respondent-driven procedure. Each participant was at least 1 16th Native American and was between the ages of 18 and 70 years. They were assessed with the semi-structured assessment for the genetics of alcoholism, which generates DSM-3R diagnoses. Of the 580 respondents, 254 were given lifetime diagnoses of alcohol dependence. Remission was defined as having no symptom of alcohol dependence for six months or longer at the time of interview. Of those with lifetime diagnoses, 59% met the criterion for remission. This rate is comparable to rates in studies of populations whose ancestry is predominantly European. Stepwise logistic regression analyses of factors putatively associated with successful remission identified several variables. Being older, female or married, having an earlier onset, and having self-reported depression symptoms related to drinking. The absence of remission was associated with continuing to drink despite medical problems and having self-reported anxiety symptoms from drinking. Some of the variables that were assessed but were not associated with remission were employment, first-degree family history of alcohol dependence, degree of Native American heritage, childhood conduct disorder, anxiety and affective disorders, and ever having had treatment for problems related to alcohol use. Several factors associated with remission in this American Indian group are consistent with those for the general U.S. population, such as female gender, greater age, and being married. A surprising and novel finding was that self-reported depressive symptoms from drinking had a significant role in increasing the chances of remission, and conversely, anxiety symptoms from drinking were related to a lower likelihood of remission. The authors note that these were not depression and anxiety symptoms occurring in the context of alcohol withdrawal, as a specific question about withdrawal-related symptoms did not produce significant findings. Joe Westermeyer comments on these findings in his editorial, A Sea Change in the Treatment of Alcoholism. He states that perhaps the most salient finding is the relatively high rate of six-month remission. 59% in an ethnic group whose remission rates 25 years ago range from 0 to 21%. Over the last few decades, many tribal leaders have identified substance abuse as a major social and health problem. Also, many American Indian professionals and researchers have devoted their efforts to eliminating substance abuse from American Indian lives and communities. Findings in this report reflect deep changes in all sectors of American society that foster remission. For example, in this study, only 36% of the people with alcohol dependence receive specific treatment for alcohol problems. Today, many people in the United States achieve remission following brief interventions and ongoing support for sobriety from many sectors outside specialty alcoholism care. These other sectors include primary health care, family members and friends, visiting nurses, staff of social agencies and jails, schools, churches, corporations, courts, and law enforcement officers. 
As a result of this virtual revolution in society at large, the characteristics of those who achieve remission has changed irrevocably. Formerly, women and those with depression had poor prognoses compared to others with alcohol dependence. In this study, these characteristics predicted remission as they do in other populations. These momentous changes have been due to modifications of treatment systems. For example, many alcoholism treatment programs now meet the special needs of women by providing child care, integration of substance abuse services with physical and mental health care, special programs for women, and staff workshops in the care of women with substance disorders. The authors note remission with increased age in their sample, described as the aging out of alcoholism previously observed in Navajo and other American Indian drinkers. This may reflect the respected role of elders in tribal societies. It could also be the result of high mortality among American Indian drinkers, many of whom binge drink within a group rather than alone. Many American Indian drinkers have elected for sobriety after drinking companions have died. These data might also cause one to question the utility of alcoholism treatment, since remission rates were similar for those with and without treatment. Identifying people who sought treatment and those who did not would allow a critical comparison. Compared to those who have not sought treatment, treatment seekers generally comprise a more morbid group with fewer factors favoring remission. If this were the case in this group, the fact that the post-treatment remission rate equaled that in the non-treatment group would credit alcoholism treatment. Challenges remain. Gilder and colleagues found a lifetime prevalence of alcohol dependence of 44%. American Indian communities are experimenting with preventive approaches, including on-reservation prohibition, abstinence-oriented religion and spirituality, peer pressure against public drunkenness, and non-drinking powwows. In addition, weaknesses in our treatment alternatives test our resolve and ingenuity. This study documented the high rate of treatment resistance. Half of the respondents who had been treated had not achieved remission, a fairly typical finding nationally in community programs. Now we'll conclude with the study by Laura Almasy and colleagues, a genome screen for quantitative trait loci influencing schizophrenia and neurocognitive phenotypes. The sample came from 43 families with multiple members affected by schizophrenia. A total of more than 600 affected and unaffected individuals were included in the genome scan. Diagnoses were based on information gathered with the Diagnostic Interview for Genetic Studies, the Family Interview for Genetic Studies, and a review of available medical records. Cognitive measures were also used as alternative schizophrenia phenotypes. Nine cognitive traits were tested through a computerized battery, abstraction and mental flexibility, attention, verbal memory, face memory, spatial memory, language and reasoning, spatial processing, emotion processing, and sensory motor dexterity. From the genome scan, significant evidence for linkage of the schizophrenia diagnosis to a region on chromosome 19q was observed. This appears to be a new finding. The analysis of cognitive traits revealed significant linkage to a chromosome 5q region for the domain of abstraction and mental flexibility. This region has previously been associated with schizophrenia. A variety of other neurocognitive traits also showed nominal evidence of linkage to the 5Q region. Joint analyses with diagnosis suggested that this quantitative trait locus may also influence schizophrenia. Lisa Brustowitz and Ann Bassett comment on this study in their editorial, Phenotype Matters, the case for careful characterization of relevant traits. They describe the strengths of using quantitative phenotypes. Ideally, the correlation between quantitative traits and the extent of DNA sequence that individuals share in each region of the genome can be assessed. This allows for a more efficient use of the genetic information. Unaffected family members who have abnormal scores on some measures can now contribute as much to the analysis as individuals with the categorical disease diagnosis. 
In addition, all individuals with a given diagnostic status, either affected or unaffected, are no longer considered phenotypically equal. The use of quantitative measures can provide a tremendous boost to the power of a linkage analysis when the trait involves expression of the genetic variants of interest. Two noteworthy linkage signals were detected in this study. One involved a quantitative phenotype, efficiency of abstraction and mental flexibility, and the other one was related to the categorical phenotype. Because multiple correlated phenotypes were used, it is difficult to assess if these results rise to a rigorous level of statistical significance after correction for multiple testing. Despite the theoretical advantages of quantitative trait analysis and testing of multiple plausible domains, the quantitative trait analysis was performed similarly to the analysis using categorical diagnoses. Each type of analysis identified one locus of interest with similar magnitudes of statistical support. So we may be left asking, did the quantitative trait analysis live up to the expectations? To answer this question, we need to better understand some of the features of quantitative trait analysis. Quantitative trait leakage analysis outperforms a categorical analysis when the trait of interest is truly quantitative and the categorical analysis is based on a forced dichotomization of the trait. For example, if we want to find genes related to height and we conduct a study categorizing our subjects as tall or not tall based on some arbitrary value, we have unnecessarily discarded much of the possible phenotypic information in our study sample. A person of average stature and a person with congenital dwarfism will both be classified as not tall. On the other hand, a person who is one centimeter taller than the cutoff will receive a different categorical label than the person who is one centimeter shorter than the cutoff. Suppose instead that the trait is something more complex, such as being a successful professional basketball player. We could readily derive a consensus definition of success. Observing that the majority of players categorized as successful are tall and that being tall tends to run in families, we might be tempted to conduct a linkage study of height as an end of phenotype of basketball prowess, hypothesizing that genes that control height contribute to success as a basketball player. However, height is determined by the interplay of multiple genes as well as important environmental influences. Just because a trait can be accurately measured does not mean it will necessarily be simple to find the genes controlling it. Also, height may not be the most important factor in determining success at basketball. However, the situation is not this direct in the Almacy study. Schizophrenia, unlike success in basketball, has been demonstrated to have a significant inherited component. Its heritability is greater than 80%. The heritability of individual neurocognitive measures is less than that, but the measures such as those in this study show moderate levels of heritability, supporting their attractiveness as endophenotypes for schizophrenia. Such quantitative traits could increase power for genetic studies if they identified genetically relevant subtypes of schizophrenia or if their underlying genetic architecture was simpler than that of schizophrenia. To date, there is little evidence for either of these possibilities. The best phenotype for genetic studies of schizophrenia is not entirely clear. The Almacy study represents a very important empirical test of the utility of endophenotypes in linkage analyses of schizophrenia, and it suggests that there may be greater utility in combining endophenotypes with standard diagnostic phenotypes. For inherited genetic diseases, the goal is to discern the clinical definitions that most closely correspond with the genetic causes of the illness. The development of disease definitions usually includes surveying family members to determine what alternative forms the disorder may take. It is also critical to remember that genetic heterogeneity is the norm in nature, and a single clinical label does not imply an underlying homogeneous etiology. A survey across the disease for clinically identifiable genetic subtypes can significantly decrease genetic heterogeneity.
With few exceptions, these are not the processes used to derive the reliable psychiatric disease definitions we currently use. However, these categorical definitions demonstrate high heritability, have resulted in the most significant findings to date, and are the entities we wish to better understand. One may be tempted to consider using very large samples to test a quantitative or categorical trait hypothesis, but this will not guarantee success. In addition to potentially introducing greater genetic heterogeneity, increasing sample size at the cost of genetically relevant knowledge can result in a loss of power to localize susceptibility loci. While there is always the hope that the next new laboratory technique or statistical method will suddenly be able to find clear genetic signals where there were none before, the reality is that without excellent clinical data, the odds will always be heavily against us. Even technological advances that identify new molecular genetic entities, such as copy number variation, require detailed clinical characterization for interpretation. A focus on careful assessment of the most genetically relevant phenotypes must be maintained as we move into the next phase of genetic studies of schizophrenia. This concludes the audio highlights of the September issue of the American Journal of Psychiatry. We invite you to our website, ajp.psychiatryonline.org, for the full text of these and other articles. We also welcome comments regarding this audio. They can be emailed to Jane Weaver. Her email address is jweaver at psych.org. Thank you. Thank you.